Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's event here at the Jesus College Intellectual Forum. Uh, my name is Julian Huppert. I'm the director of the forum, and it's a great pleasure to run this, the third of a series of events that we're doing with the legacy of slavery working parties. We think as a college about our legacy of slavery and the wider context. Uh, for some of you will know Jesus College extremely well. For some of you, this may be your first time here, either in person, this wonderful Frankopan Hall, or online. It's great to have you with us uh, as well, wherever you happen to be. There's an amazing history to this college. We were set up in 1144, uh, when a small group of itinerant nuns were given a little plot of land outside the small town of Cambridge. It's expanded and changed over the centuries. But for all that time has been a place of thought, of scholarship. There have been some amazing people who have come from here to change the world. We celebrate some of them for the good that they did. We're learning more about some of them and the harm that they did as well. But there are certainly some who we are very proud of, even as we learn about some of the foibles and failings of many of the others. I'm not going to say too much. I'm going to hand over to somebody who's been living this for many years, who's been working solidly, leading our Legacy of Slavery Working Party. It's always a great pleasure to work with Veronique, Professor Veronique Mottier, who is a, a fellow here and, and does a huge amount for the college, but is also a professor in Lausanne. So there's a certain amount of commuting, and it's a very impressive cycle ride between here and Lausanne that she manages to do uh, to go and give lectures there. Uh, Veronique has had that challenge of, of chairing the Legacy of Slavery Working Party. I think this is the last official event from it. So this is, I don't know if celebration is the right word, but I think we can celebrate the work that you have done. Uh, so I will hand over to Veronique to run this. Uh, we'll have a talk. There will be questions. If you're online, please do the Q&A feature, and you can be involved as well. So Veronique... Lovely to have you here. Over to you. Thank you very much, Julian. And uh, as Julian Huppert has mentioned, uh, we've, we're getting to the last stages of a huge collective task uh, with the whole team, the Legacies of Slavery Working Party. We are getting to the end of our inquiry. Um, this kind of research has been done standing on the shoulders of giants, and we have one of these giants here with us today. Uh, I cannot emphasize enough how much the work of Catherine Hall has inspired us and has also given us a, a blueprint as to how to do this kind of research. Uh, she has been a pioneer in this field. Her work was, done in, uh, was started in 2009 with uh, the Legacies of British Slave Ownership Project, which has really transformed not just this whole field, but I would also say the national culture. And perhaps not enough yet, <laughs> there's still a lot of work to be done still, but it has had an amazing impact on the national debate on uh, topics such as legacies of slavery, but also reparation, recognition, acknowledgement, and, and so on. Uh, so it's an immense honor to uh, be able to close the series of talks uh, organized by the LSWP uh, with a talk by uh, Professor Catherine Hall. Uh, who is an emeritus uh, professor of history at UCL and also the chair of the Centre for uh, the Studies of the Legacies of, Brit of uh, British Slavery. Um, she also uh, initiated the setting up of a, a very, very uh, influential database, the Database of the Legacies of British Slave Ownership, which, if you haven't looked at it yet, I would really encourage you to look at it. The historians amongst you know about this. Uh, for others, this may be new. So this is an amazing resource and uh, one of the important uh, outcomes of, uh, of our very, very groundbreaking <laughs> research. So without further ado, uh, I will not read out the long list of publications, but le let you Google that and give the floor so we can have more time to listen to Professor Hall. Thank you so much. Oops. Okay, I must put my microphone on. So I have to... Okay, can you hear me? Very good. Well, I'd like to thank Veronique Mottier and the College's Legacies of Slavery Working Party for the invitation to be here today. I've followed something of what the College has been engaged in, the process of critical self-reflection on the long-term legacies of slavery and violence 
and know that this has provoked debate. Tackling these questions inevitably brings controversy and conflict, for they touch deep feelings and beliefs about Britain's past and present. Some want to refuse the idea that the past lives on in the present, that there is a debt to be paid for the exploitation of subject peoples and the spoliation of land and of lives, which enabled the accumulation of wealth in the UK and the embedding of inequalities. So the case has to be made, old histories unpicked and rewritten, a necessary part of any project of repair, the repair for wrongs done, which can never be put right. In the many investigations which have been done in these last years, from the universities and colleges to the Bank of England, the Church of England, the major galleries, and just this week, Lloyds of London, who resisted it for a very long time. The focus is often on the money, following the money. This is, of course, very important, but so too are the ways in which the slavery business made a key contribution to the embedding of racisms in British culture. And it's that that my work over the last decade and more, actually, has been particularly focused on. So my story this evening concerns Edward Long, the author of the three-volume History of Jamaica, published in 1774. Uh, this is the history. And Edward Long's three volumes, I argue, can help us to understand both how money flowed into the UK from plantation slavery and how forms of racialization flowed alongside. And this is him. His great-grandfather, Samuel, was one of the founding fathers of the colony. Edward was born and educated in England. He spent some of his childhood at the family home in Tredudwell, Cornwall, a place which I think in the 1750s the unexpected death of his father in 1757 left him with a meager inheritance. He was advised by his uncle Beeston, the head of the London West India Merchant House of Drake and Long, to go to Jamaica, which was a place to make a fortune. At the age of 23, he borrowed capital and established himself as a planter, buying Lucky Valley, from his older brother, Robert. In 
the idea of improvement was central to 18th century landowners and he was determined to make enough money to return to the mother country, which is how he always referred to England. Within months of his arrival, uh, he had made an advantageous marriage to Mary Ballard Beckford, the daughter of an established slave-owning family on the island. Good marriages, as they, were thought, as they were thought of, and careful management of inheritance was crucial to the survival of colonial families. During his 11 years in Jamaica, he bought enslaved people and land, rebuilt the works at Lucky Valley, and increased the yield of sugar and rum very substantially. In 1760, a major rebellion took place on the island, which left him fully aware of the dangers inherent in the slave society with its massive demographic imbalance and convinced him of the urgent need for more white settlement. He took an active part in colonial politics, asserting the rights of freeborn Englishmen to their legal and political privileges and objecting to what he described as the tyranny of the colonial governors and metropolitan authorities. By 1769, he had accumulated enough capital to return to England with his young family, expecting to live the life of a well-to-do West Indian, as they were called, thanks to his Jamaican property, both in land and people, and the ever-expanding demand for King Sugar. On his return to England, he found that much had changed. The end of the Seven Years' War in 1763 had brought a signal increase in Britain's global power over land and peoples, provoking questions about the meaning of British subjecthood. Could American Indians, Caribs, Africans, or South Asian peoples, all people of colour, could they be British? These questions have a long history. When he had left England in 1757, few voices had been raised against colonial slavery, which was commonly accepted as contributing to Britain's wealth. By the time he returned, the question as to whether slavery was legal in England had become a matter of public concern. The slave trade had been legalized by Parliament, but what about slavery? The case of James Somerset put this to the test. Somerset had been brought to England by the man who claimed ownership of him, James Stuart, but had managed to escape. He was subsequently kidnapped onto a ship for passage to the Caribbean and re-enslavement. Mansfield, the Lord Chief Justice, freed Somerset in 1772 declaring slavery to be repugnant at home. He demarcated between England, a place that did not permit the kidnapping of Africans in order to re-enslave them, and the colonies, places where slavery was legitimate. The slave owners were enraged. This challenged their right as freeborn Englishmen to hold what they believed was, quotes, their property. Long was already writing a history of Jamaica. He now realized it must actively defend slavery. He had to convince his metropolitan audience that colonial slavery was essential to British wealth and power, that black people were naturally different and born to serve those who were white. The Somerset trial marked an iconic moment a moment of rupture in metropolitan understandings of racial difference. Thinking about the slave trade and slavery as in some respects un-English had broken through an established common sense. Critics were accumulating evidence of the cruelties associated with the slave trade and of the brutalities of the slave owners. This heralded a new time, a new conjuncture a time of intensifying struggle with pro-slavery forces mobilizing and anti-slavery voices no longer marginalized, 
but gradually moving into the center ground of politics and culture. The protracted conflict only concluded with the abolition of first the slave trade in 1807 and then slavery in 1834. That moment ushered in a new conjuncture, new articulations of racial hierarchy, new struggles over the meanings of race and freedom, a new configuration of the connections between US slavery, racism and capitalism, all part of the long contested unfinished histories over the meanings of racial difference. Long published his History of Jamaica in 1774. He was speedily recognized as the authority on the island, cited by friends and enemies alike. The work circulated globally and has remained in print ever since. It's encyclopedic about Jamaica, its political and natural history, its inhabitants, its commercial system and plantation economy, its laws and topography. It aimed to tell a story of the growth from what he described as an infant colony to a settled society. And it was one of the first texts in English to maintain that racial difference was essential and natural that inequality was ordained by providence, embodied in body, blood, skin, hair, and mind. Long was a key architect, both of the practices and the theoretical justifications for racialization. His work is the subject, is my subject today. Described by Peter Fryer as the father of English racism, Aspects of his thinking, though always challenged, have lived on over the generations, embodied in racisms and in the belief that some lives matter more than others. My, sorry, my sheet doesn't want to turn over at all. I'll have to put down that. It's completely stuck. Okay. Long was centrally concerned to demonstrate that sugar and slavery together produced immense wealth for Britain, increasing the country's power and prestige. The plantations, he was convinced, required African labor. Europeans could not survive in the cane fields. Slavery was therefore essential to this national wealth. Many pages of the three volumes were devoted to documenting the wealth, tied as it was to a mercantilist economic order, fully supported by the Crown and Metropolitan Government. The Long family were both planters and West India merchants. It was the merchants who provided the capital and sold the sugar. Knowing both ends of the business, he was well positioned to explicate this system of racial capitalism, not a term that he ever used, but a term that I have come to understand as precisely what he was describing in his three volumes. In order to defend slavery, he had to demonstrate what he saw as the fixed and unchangeable identities of white and what he called Negro, free and unfree, and represent them as binary opposites. These identities were constructed both through everyday practices on the slave ship and the plantations, in homes and huts, in the courts and the towns, and in the codifications of the economic, political, and legal systems spelt out in the treatises of slave owners and others. Long participated at every level in the making and attempted fixing of these definitions, aiming to secure white power and black subordination. His history documented all these processes and gives us an astonishingly detailed picture of how race worked in 18th century Jamaica, how it positioned those with power and those without. He named himself and his family white with a capital W, owners of property and freedom. Enslaved men and women in his parlance 
were Negroes with a capital N. Let me give four brief examples of Long's account and the ways in which he wrote racial difference, representing it as natural. First of all, capture and enslavement. Long knew that the Negro trade, as he called it, the capture, kidnapping, buying and selling of men, women and children, lay at the heart of the whole slavery business. Without captives, there was no labor to plant and harvest the cane, to boil it and distill it, to load the sugar and rum on wagons to take to the harbor and ship to the metropole. The slavery business brought wealth to the mother country, not just in sugar, but in the development of so many ancillary trades, the sugar refiners, the grocers, the shipbuilders, the sailors, the iron masters, the copper makers, and so on. And when I talk about the slavery business, I mean this whole network of business in the metropole. He had to provide an account of the makings of, of captives into slaves. This was a process that started with kidnapping and sale, numbering people as chattels in ledgers, which was work for the merchants and slave traders, forcibly transporting them across the Atlantic, selling them in the Caribbean. Long wanted to skate over this process as much as possible, knowing that there were already in critics in Britain documenting its cruelty. He hoped to sanitize the trade for his readers and for himself. He mounted what became a standard defense. The trade was legitimate, recognized by parliament. It was doing a kindness to Africans since their lives in Jamaica were so much better than the life or probably death that they would have faced in their own country. Africa and Africans in his narrative were represented as barbaric. Their one-way journey across the Atlantic was a journey to civilization. Slavery was well established in Africa, he argued, and slaves were considered actual staple products as much as wool and corn are to Great Britain. In Africa, children were treated like beasts, were bred and sold like cattle, any notion of a comparison with the practices of the plantation was banished from his mind. No one in Africa, he maintained, questioned the right to buy and sell people. The slaves who were bought were captives in war, had been sold by brutal family members, or were criminals. Africans disposed of their unwanted population, just as the English did in the Americas, and had a perfect right to do this. Long rep thus represented slaves as products, things, already objects, before they were sold to the European merchants. It was fortunate for these superfluous people, as he called him, that they were saved from death by black merchants who traveled far into the interior to find them. The trade was properly conducted, regulated by the African Company and Parliament, which deemed Negroes purchased from Africa as a lawful commercial property. Some force was necessary. They had to be bound on their journey to the coast to prevent escape and shackled at the factories and on board. But given their many acts of violence, their murdering of whole crews and destroying ships, such rigor was unavoidable. His justification was essential African difference, their bloody and malicious disp disposition. They had to be confined as if they were wolves or wild boars. He named captives, staple products, superfluous people of malicious disposition, naturally thieves and villains, he animalized them like wolves or wild boars. Given the savagery of their character, he maintained, such men must be managed at first as if they were beasts. They must be tamed before they can be treated like men. Long's account of the slave trade set the scene. Slaves were already slaves, 
locked in their difference, but were heading across the Atlantic to a more civilized life than was possible in savage Africa. So my second example is the plantation. The plantation sat at the heart of the slavery business, the key to wealth. Much of that wealth belonged to the London merchants who provided the substantial capital that enabled planters to establish estates, buy and clear land, buy enslaved labor, and build works. Plantations were factories in the field, as Sid Mintz called them, since cane, once cut, had to be milled immediately in order to retain the juice. There were then a series of necessary stages, boiling, fermenting, distilling, that partially processed the cane and produced muscovado, which could be transported to Britain for further refining. Those final stages were monopolized by the mother country in order to defend manufacturers at home. The mercantilist system established from the 17th century treated the colonies as useful subsidiary adjuncts to the metropole, designed especially to produce the tropical commodities, tea, coffee, cocoa, and sugar that could not grow in temperate Britain. Long came, as I said, from a family of slave owners, and on his arrival in Jamaica in 1758, he was speedily able to align himself with the white elite and invest in Lucky Valley. We are fortunate in having a watercolor of Lucky Valley. Sorry, I'll go back to the a watercolor of Lucky Valley, painted by William Berryman, a traveling, traveling English artist in the early 19th century. This watercolor was produced for Edward Long's son. And this is a part of his history to the work of the plantation, the site for the creation of new subjects, the planter and the enslaved. He was anxious to persuade white settlers to come to Jamaica, convinced that it was essential to rebalance the population if the colony was to survive. While the numbers of Africans were growing exponentially, as was the population of people of color, the numbers of whites were not increasing, and this was dangerous. His description focused on the work of the, planter, of the planter, the head of the enterprise. It was he who made it all happen, he who created the value, oiled the wheels of the commercial machine, he who improved. The agency of the enslaved men, women, and children who did the work on the ground was disavowed. Those who hold, weeded, cut and carried, boiled and distilled were the sinews 
through whose bodies the labor process flowed. They're represented as dis disembodied labor, shows, chattels, to be bought and sold like every other commodity in the country. Enslaved people and stock were listed alongside in his accounts, a standard practice for slave owners. It was the planter who did the buying and selling, planned, directed, surveyed, instructed, supervised, judged, and punished. He was the absolute authority, the mind and master of the enterprise. Lucky Valley was transformed during Long's 11 years on the island from a plantation barely capable of producing 80 hogsheads of sugar a year to one that could produce over 300 and a tidy profit margin of over 10%. Faced with a labor force, many of whom were, in the terminology of the time, superannuated, inadequate land for cane and pasture, which was essential for the cattle to work the mill and drive the wagons and for their manure, and woodland for the timber required for the works buildings and the Negro village, as it was called, he borrowed heavily to invest and saddled himself with substantial debts. He bought enslaved labor, more land, rebuilt the works, established an effective water mill and water supply, improved the road to Long's Wharf, the point in Old Harbor Bay from which the ships were loaded. Close supervision was essential and Long knew his property well. It was this that facilitated the imposition of labor discipline, the organization of skilled and unskilled labor in terms of overall goals, the treatment of the labor force as disposable units and the careful management of time that made the system so innovative and so effective. The well-constructed machine that Long created at Lucky Valley relied on a clear division of labor rooted in classed, racialized, and gendered practices. All those at the top of the hierarchy were white and male. An overseer was his second in command, managing both white employees and the enslaved, assigning tasks on a daily basis. The white craftsmen, stock keepers, and storeman sat, sat beneath the overseer. Many of the adult enslaved men were active either as drivers responsible under the white overseers for the discipline of the field laborers, or as artisans doing the skilled work in the mills and boiling houses, acting as coopers, carpenters, stockmen, and builders. An effective gang system of labor divided the labor force according to physical strength, with the first gang made up of predominantly adult women doing the heavy work of planting and harvesting, the second gang including adolescents and those past their prime focused on lighter work, and the third gang made up of the children collecting dung and weeding. Surveys of work done on other plantations at this time have demonstrated how the increase in profits in Jamaica secured during the 1760s was dependent on the extraction of more labor from the enslaved. Long's account of the workings of the plantation then relied on a racialized division of labor. Those who were white were in command. Those who were black were commanded. So let me turn now to how he attempts to theorize racial difference. Long wanted to represent racial difference as natural. The Somerset decision had demonstrated that the law could not be relied on to protect slave owners. There had to be some other justification for slavery. In his initial response to Mansfield's judgment, Long had railed against the failure of the law, but he had to recognize that there was no positive English law legitimating slavery. So how to defend it? He turned to the body for explanations. 
As an Enlightenment man, proud of his literary and scientific knowledge, he was familiar with the philosophical and natural history debates as to the nature of the human. He was well aware of the footnote that the philosopher David Hume had penned in 1753. Hume believed in an original distinction between four or five different kinds of men. He referred to the case of one Negro in Jamaica, a man of parts and learning, but it is likely he is mad for very slender accomplishments, like a parrot who speaks a few words plainly. The man was Francis Williams, a free black man who had been sent to England as a child by the Duke of Montague as the subject of an experiment. If an African were educated in the same way as an Englishman, would he have the same accomplishments? Were Africans capable of writing, a skill that was seen in the 18th century as a defining feature of what it was to be fully human? Williams was known to have written Latin poetry and studied mathematics. One of Long's fellow planters, Samuel Estwick, in his extensive refutation of the Somerset judgment, had cited Hume and added on the basis of his experience as a planter that there is but one genus, one kind of man, under the term mankind, subordinate to which there are several sorts or species of men differing from each other. The difference between these sorts of men, according to Estwick, lay in the possession of a moral sense. It was this which distinguished man from man. Negroes were incapable of moral sensations, he claimed, could only perceive them as beasts do, as simple ideas. Ethiopians could not change their skin, nor leopards their spots. Africans differed from other men, not in kind, but in species. The legislature had perceived the corporeal as well as intellectual differences of Negroes from other people, and supposed they were an inferior race of people, he wrote, so named them articles of its trade and commerce, best thought of as property. And Estwick didn't like to use the term slaves at all. He liked to use the term property. Estwick's thinking provided Long with a way of putting together the fruits of his experience in Jamaica, his certainty that Cain and the wealth that flowed from it could only be produced by enslaved Africans with selected arguments from the Enlightenment debates on the human. The enslaved had limited capacities, he claimed, disavowing his knowledge of their multiple skills on which Lucky Valley depended. He adopted the language and persona of the philosopher a name he chose for himself, and engaged with a range of well-known figures, anatomists, natural historians, and travelers, claiming a place in their ranks. One genus, different species. This was conceptualized as an explanation of the differences between Africans and the rest of mankind. It was well known that animals were of many kinds, with subordinate species, wrote Long. The divine being had inaugurated a general system of the world built on gradation and difference. The work of natural historians had made a very significant break with conventional biblical thinking in classifying men as part of the animal kingdom. What then were the differences between men and animals? And what were the differences between different varieties of men? As the European slavery business gathered pace in the 18th century, the prodigious enigma of blackness was preoccupying essayists, theologians, natural historians, and anatomists. <clears throat> 
whiteness provided the norm. What caused blackness and what did it signify? When and why had degeneration, as it was described, from that white norm begun? Some argued that climate was the key, as, as did Montesquieu. Others disputed this, insisting that the causes were internal rather than external. Explanations based on the surface of the skin were associated with climate and environment. Anatomists, on the other hand, claimed their explanations were rooted in the blood and bile of the black body. Blackness was located on the inside rather than the outside. The white and the Negro had not one common origin, Long wrote. This was an opinion which several have entertained. For my own part, he continued, there are extremely potent reasons for believing that the white and the Negro are two distinct species. This provided an explanation for the diversities of feature, skin, and intellect amongst mankind. And he expiated on the many varieties of dogs, horses, and monkeys coming to the orangutan species, which had the strongest similitude to mankind in countenance, figure, stature, organs, erect posture, actions or movements, food, temper, and manner of living. The figure of the orangutan, or chimpanzee, was central to debates on the science of man from the 1630s to the 1770s and beyond. What, if anything, distinguished the ape from the human? Most natural historians agreed that though apes had human characteristics, they were not human. Much attention was devoted to questions as whether they could think, speak, walk erect, or create culture. Madame Chimpanzee, as she was named, was exhibited in London in 1738. The spectacle of her polite table manners and tea drinking provoked much public, public comment, her civility offering a counterpoint to ima imagined African savagery. Orangutans, it was believed, had human feelings, a capacity to express sensibility, since it was not animated with a superior principle. For Buffon, the orangutan was very close to man and should be placed in the second class of animal beings. But, Long insisted, Buffon had no decisive proofs of this. Orangutans had social feeling, passions, traces of reason. They were nearest to brutes. Linking the orangutan sexually to the African, he wrote, ludicrous as the opinion may seem, I do not think that an orangutan husband would be any dishonor to a Hottentot female. Hottentots were stupid and brutal, more like beasts than men, one of the meanest nations on the face of the earth. Has the Hottentot a more manly figure than the orangutan? that the orangutan and some races of men are very nearly allied is, I think, more than probable. This was the crux of Long's claim. The animalization of the savage, as Silvia Sebastiani suggests, was constructed through the humanization of the ape. When the human-animal divide narrowed, the divide between savage and civilized people increased and, and crystallized, facilitating the establishment of a racial hierarchy. Orangutans, 
long maintained, were not at all inferior in the intellectual faculties to many of the Negro race. The orangutan long concluded has in form a much nearer resemblance to the Negro race than the latter bear to white men. And citing our immortal Shakespeare on the differences in men, he argued, the species of every other genus have their certain mark and distinction, their varieties and subordinate classes. Why not the race of mankind? So my final example is of Francis Williams, the man that Hume had cited. Long hoped to clinch his argument about the inferiority of the African by returning to the case of Francis Williams and mounting a demolition. It was his test case intended to be a conclusive performance of the inferiority of the Negroes to the race of white men. His contempt for Williams was designed to confirm any doubts that either he himself or his readers might have as to the essential superiority of white men. Williams had received a classical English education, something in Cambridge, and had entered the inns of court just like Long. Long's white skin meant that he was able to practice law and engage in government in Jamaica. Williams, although a free black man, was barred on account of his blackness. But he had land in property and people and was prepared to challenge his status, believing that there was no shame in bearing, as he put it, a white body in black skin, a claim that was wholly a He had attempted to refuse an objected and expelled position outside and trouble the dreams of those who were comfortable inside. It was imperative to cut him down to, redu to size, to re reduce him, if possible, to a bad joke. The portrait was the work of an unknown artist, probably the art historian David Beinman. 
work, was contemptuous of the school he had established and his efforts to educate black boys who simply turned into parodies of their master and he mocked his Latin poetry, asked rhetorically whether all species of humankind have the moral sense, the answer to which, in his opinion, was clear, clearly not. He claimed that Williams was haughty, opinionated, looked down with sovereign contempt on his fellow blacks, had an absurdly inflated sense of his own knowledge, was disdainful of his parents, and severe bordering upon cruelty in his treatment of his children and his slaves. He paid too much attention to dress, sporting a huge wig and adopting a grave cast of countenance, an attempt to imply wisdom and learning. The moral part of his character could be deduced from all this. He had not the modesty to be silent. Offended by what he saw as the displaced vanity of the man in authoring a Latin ode and presenting it to a new governor on his arrival in Jamaica, long published, translated, and annotated a version of the poem. Writing in Latin, long believed, was suited to white gentlemen, not Negroes. His translation represented Williams as more ponderous and pompous than he was. His pretensions, as long and others saw them, to be a political and intellectual equal with white people must be challenged. His claim to be a white man with a black skin, as he put it, that's how Williams is put it, <laughs> could not be tolerated. The Spanish have a proverbial saying long noted, though we are blacks, we are men. The truth of which he continued, no one will dispute, but if we allow the system of created beings to be perfect and consistent, he continued, and that this perfection arises from an exact scale of gradation, from the lowest to the highest, combining and connecting every part into a regular and beautiful harmony, reasoning them from the visible plan and operation of infinite wisdom in respect to the human race, as well as every other series in the scale, we must, I think, conclude that the general order since the time began is kept in nature and is kept in man. Order is heaven's first law and this confessed, some are and must be greater than the rest. In misquoting the immortal Christian poet Pope by connecting two separate couplets, he racialized the lines and hoped to secure his case. But Williams had answered back in his poetry and his painting. And today, in the context of the many efforts to rethink Britain's, of his, Britain's history of slavery, the Victorian Albert, which has had the portrait since the 1920s, has now realized what a treasure it possesses. The first self-portrait of a black Atlantic man who refused the efforts of others to categorize him. He stands as counter-history to Long, no radical in the ways in which we would now understand that term, a black man who owned enslaved others and wanted his skin to be irrelevant, but he refused the idea that skin mattered and insisted that black people were equal to white. A small exhibition at the V&A now features the portrait of Francis Williams and contextual materials next to the work of the Birmingham Black
Thank you. Thank you very much. That was uh, fascinating and, of course, also very troubling whenever one gets reminded in such details about what happened and how people were thinking. <clears throat> I was, throughout your talk, uh, it, it was so focused on an English construction. And I was therefore wondering about whether, for example, the concept of the gentleman <coughs> and the construction of class within England uh, give it some characteristic that one would not find in the same construction of racism in, in for example, the Netherlands or in Portugal during the same time. I know that's not your topic, but what, uh, because you were so stressing in some way uh, England as the motherland and the concept of the gentleman, you sort of wonder about whether the parallel processes nonetheless also have different characteristics. Thank you. I think there would be. I mean, um, obviously there are such powerful links across continental Europe into England at this time. Um, and Long, of course, was reading in French and in Latin um, as well as in English. So in that sense, uh, he was a European gentleman, but he was also incredibly English <laughs> and very devoted to the idea of himself as an Englishman, but certainly an English gentleman. And I think you can see uh, how Francis Williams, in his own way, is uh, referring back to that idea of the gentleman and his desire to be part in some sense of that world, part of the culture of taste um, and of gentility, which he had encountered in England while he was living here. Long was in London in the 1750s, and that's the time when he was really growing up. I mean, it was a time, his time as a young man. And he actually, he was obviously imagining at that time that he might be a writer. And so he wrote um, a very, very bad novel and published a periodical, which is also almost unreadable for anybody other than those who want to understand what was going on in his mind. But that, that culture of taste uh, is extremely powerful for him. And of course, it's played out uh, in ideas about domesticity, in very powerful ideas about um, what came to be called much later the separate spheres of men and women, all of which I think you would find mirrored in different ways in France uh, and in the Netherlands. So all these, all these slaving powers, they share, of course, I mean, what we're discovering more and more is the extent of the movement between them and of the mobility between the colonies and the, I mean, how the businesses were organized on a, um, a continental European uh, basis, as well as being specifically national. So one of the other things that I think is happening, actually, is that, I mean, Long is a nationalist, you know, but um, we're having to unpick the national histories as well as um, the pro-slavery histories and think about the much, the, the extraordinary networks of the slavery business across continental Europe, going right into Germany and uh, Switzerland and Italy, all across, and indeed into the Baltic. So I think you'd find the figure of the gentleman, um, definitely. And I'm just thinking about the artwork of the period. Uh, I think you'd find it reflected there. Though the Netherlands is obviously much more, it's so much more a mercantile culture than England, which is, I mean, Long is really part of the generation that absolutely is committed to a landed culture. He comes back, he wants to live in the country. I mean, he also has a house in London, but 
you know, he's, he's a landed. He wants to be a gentleman. He wants his children to inherit property in England, which, of course, could be su supported by the colonial ventures. But they should be here. The dynasty should be here. Question from uh, Janet Soskis. Thank you very much for a wonderful um, lecture, and I echo what Mary Louise has said. I was struck by um, the emphasis that came up at various stages on enlightenment, the enlightenment man, and um, uh, of course, the striking reference to Hume, who's still taught as a sort of god in English philosophy, um, and uh, uh, the kind of scientism. I wondered about the kind of scientism. You mentioned, of course, there's this racial capitalism, which is obviously burgeoning at this time, but I wonder about the, how the scientism, perhaps enlightenment scientism, fed into this project. It absolutely does. I mean, I think that, um, I mean, scholars, um, people who work on the intellectual history of race have been interested in long forever, but basically they read two chapters of the history. And what happened to me when I read the whole three volumes was I realized how much more he was doing than thinking about racialization. Racialization runs through the whole thing, but so does the organization of the slavery business, which is why I come to the concept of racial capitalism. But he was an enlightenment man, and I don't think, you know, the tendency have, would, has been to think of him as just, you know, he's a horrible pro-slaver. But I think seeing him in his Enlightenment context and knowing, as we now do, much more about the arguments about race that were going on in the Enlightenment, the people, there was an argument. There was always a debate about it. It wasn't that they were all racists or they were all pro-abolition. Uh, they were really arguing and engaging with all these questions of what it meant to be human. And in that sense, the scientific work, I mean, the work of the anatomists is incredibly important. Um, and then, of course, it turns by the 1790s, it turns to the question of the skull and all that develops from that. So Long is fascinated by, I mean, the third volume of the history starts off with a whole discussion of the physical characteristics um, of meteorology. He kept a diary about the weather uh, he was reading the contemporary scientists like Priestley and so on. He refers to all these people. He's also interested in the environment. I mean, he's seriously worried that, uh, for example, about the destruction of, ma of mahogany on the island, that it's doing damage to... I mean, all kinds of interesting things which you wouldn't expect in somebody who is known simply as a, as a pro-slavery uh, person. So I think that enlightenment man of science and the humanities is very much a part of who he was and how he was educated. I mean, his favorite reading, I mean, the, you know, one of the things that got me hooked actually on the three volumes was that the second volume, the first half of the second volume is, it takes you round the whole of the island You'd find it fascinating, very neat, because it takes you around the island, and he describes it with such love. You know, he's passionate about Jamaica in a funny kind of way, as well as seeing it basically as a source of wealth for the mother country. He sees its beauty, and of course he wants to organize that beauty in terms of the interests of the production of wealth. But he uses, you know, he uses... James Thompson, his favorite poet is James Thompson. He uses Virgil, he uses Livy, he uses, uh, you know, that it's full of these uh, of references to the culture of the period, a very, what we might call, he produces, this pro-slaver produces what we might call a very civilized history, which people can read thinking, you know, this is a highly educated man who is helping us to think about these things and understand how this system works. Uh, we've had a few questions in from online. Sure. Um, so if I start off with one from DJ Anthony, who's watching, or is at least from St Vincent and the Grenadines, uh, yeah. who says, could you consider expanding the timeline to include pre-slavery impacts? 
uh, and the genocide of the indigenous residents before enslaved uh, Africans. This would offer a more balanced perspective often overlooked. What are your thoughts on incorporating this historical context? Well, um, I mean, the problem about that is my study is about Edward Long's history of Jamaica, and Edward Long has n uh, no interest whatsoever in the, uh, pre, in the culture of the pre-colonial period. He knows nothing about the Taino and the people who were in Jamaica. I should be not addressing you, but addressing the person who was in the Grenadines. So from that point of view, this is not a text. It's not helpful at all from that point of view. There is obviously a whole, there is a prehistory of colonialism, but long, I mean, history for long starts with the arrival of the English in Jamaica in 1655, and he has, you know, a very short section on the place of the Spanish before, but only to dismiss them and get on with the story of Jamaica as a colony. So it's the wrong text to address those problems, which are, of course, very, very important. And, I mean, as, as many of you will probably know, the, the CARICOM um, agreed position on reparations is that it, it's to do with the genocide of the indigenous peoples of the Caribbean, as well as African slavery and its consequences. Um, the, the, there's, there's a few. So the next one I'd, I'd ask is from Anne Wilson, uh, which is perhaps more, more relevant to the text. What was the impact in Jamaica of the Huguenot merchants, their international networks? Well, I, I, he doesn't have much to say about Huguenot merchants, but he has a lot to say about the French, because, and all that's very interesting, because in the 1750s in England, there was a massive hostility um, to the French, because of course there was the Seven Years' War was about to break out, and France was seen as the traditional enemy of England. So he joins in, you know, he's part of the um, Francophobia that is so common in England uh, in the 1750s. But then when he gets to Jamaica, Jamaica is very, very close to, uh, to Cuba, to uh, Saint Domingue. Um, I mean, it's you know, it's it's very far away from the rest of the British colonies in the Caribbean. So there was no way you could avoid thinking about other patterns of colonization. He's also interested in the North American colonies, and he sees that in some ways French colonialism is very privileged in comparison with the English because the French aristocratic, autocratic government had supported the development of the colonies in ways that he thinks the English haven't. So, but it's quite funny. When I talk about, when I've spoken about this in France, of course, they immediately tell me that in France, everybody thinks, you know, all the French colonists at the time thought that the British treated their colonists much better than the French did. So there's just this sense of whoever's doing it somewhere else is doing it better than or worse than our lot were doing it. So he, he was for including, um, you know, although he's so passionately committed to the English, uh, he knows very well that the Scots are very important and the Irish are very important to the slavery economy, as are the Jewish population, which was long established in Jamaica. And so he wants to include all these different nationalities. They, they should be part of the white population. He does see them as part of the white population. Uh, Lizzie Collingham. Thank you. That was really interesting. I'm, I'm afraid this isn't a very well thought out question. That's OK. However, when you, when you were quoting from him, you were using some kind of managerial speak, of what I think of as managerial speak, you know, the way that companies and um, now you sort of objectify things and take away the human side by sort of using euphemistic language, which is also very reminiscent of the way that the, um, the Nazis did with the Jews mm -hmm. and so on. It's re very reminiscent language. And I just wondered whether there might be some, because it's the, the, the plantations are one of the first factories, the first agro-industrial mm -hmm. things, whether something 
there's something about, and also the, the, the Jewish uh, Holocaust was also very um, mechanized and factory. I wonder if there's something to do with that sort of, there's a link between industrialism, factories, managerial speak. I'm just, it's, it's not really a question, is it? It's just a thought. Mm -hmm. it, it seemed so, it suddenly jumped out at me the way it reminded me so much of that sort of, if you have a, if you have a structure like that, you can then start replacing human, ide the idea of a human with a, the idea of a machine. Oh. Yes, no, 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 I mean, <laughs> no, no, I think your random thought is highly relevant. I think, I mean, to me, what's fundamental about this system and why it matters so much that we understand this history is that what's being denied is the humanity of Africans. And it's the denial of humanity, the construction of Africans as commodities, as chattels, which is what makes it possible to treat people in the ways that they are treated. But I take as a as a key concept in, in the book that I've written, I think that the way of managing to do this, if you're a planter, is through a process of denial and disavowal. That is to say, you know perfectly well that Africans are human. You rely on all their human characteristics to do the work that you need them and force them and coerce them to do through an entire system of violence. But you refuse that, you deny it, and therefore you quell your own feelings of responsibility or guilt. You refuse to recognize your responsibility. And I think that's absolutely crucial. And I think not only is it relevant to... I mean, I think it just runs through our histories, the way in which some people, I mean, some of the language that, that Long uses, when he calls, when he talks about superfluous population, where have you heard that before? You know, when did you hear that here? <laughs> or when you think of people being animals, we've been hearing that very, very recently, and therefore it's perfectly okay to kill them. So that denial of humanity strikes me which can result in anti-blackness or anti-Semitism or anti-Chinese or anti-South Asian or anti-Palestinian or anti, you know, and on and on and on. It's that which seems to me to be, which takes us way beyond the question of whether, you know, particular slave owners put money into Jesus College, which I'm not saying it doesn't matter, it does matter, but there's something so much bigger that's going on in the denial of personhood. And that's why also I, you know, when people get very snotty about the abolitionists and how, you know, you know, what they don't understand and how they're not radical enough and so on and so forth, I also want to defend them because they insist on the personhood of, they say, it's impossible to, it is immoral to possess people. And that's the basis of the abolitionist argument. Of course, the problem then was that in the paying of compensation to the slave owners, which is where our whole process at LBS started, by recognizing um, payment, they're saying, they're pricing people for the last time, at least in that way, in the British Empire. So, I mean, many of the radical abolitionists were deeply shocked and furious about the payment of compensation. But of course, the argument was, we can't get it through Parliament. We certainly can't get it through the House of Lords unless we are a bit more pragmatic, unless we compromise in these ways. So... I suppose I want to say these are arguments, they're never finished. They're finished in the particular form in which Long represents them. But I mean, I find it fascinating now actually to think of the figure of the orangutan. I mean, that argument's not finished. What, are the, what distinguishes between us and the ape? 
you know, when you watch what apes are capable of doing and how they care for each other and so on and so forth and how they cultivate and how they, you know, you, you've all seen uh, enough of David Attenborough and so on to know that we've got a pretty complicated story to tell about the relation between the human and the animal and it's unfinished. I was wondering um, how much were you able to reconstruct or recover any of the history of the enslaved people on, on Long's own plantations? Are there any traces of their lives other than their names? Or? Well, for Long, it's very, very limited. You know, in the, hi in the three volumes, n hundred page, thousand pages, he names literally one or two Africans. And usually they're the loyal ones who, you know, protected the masters at the time of the 1760 rebellion or whatever. I have got a very small number of indentures which have survived, which means that I can see the names of some people, but that's literally it. But of course, the minute you get a bit later, this is still very early. I mean, the 1760s, it's very, very difficult to trace enslaved lives. I mean, our project now at the center, the new research that we're engaging in, is based on what are called the slave registers, which are the registers that were made at the insistence of the abolitionists uh, in all the British colonies of the population, of the enslaved population. The point of which was to trace through a census every three years, the extent to which the illegal slave trade was carrying on. And so they're an incredible resource, but their lists, you know, their name, whether they're Creole or African, age. If you're lucky in some of the, in the crown colonies, it gives occupation. It's, it's literally, it's minimal. But if you put that together with baptismal records and parish records, you can begin painstakingly to produce some greater sense of enslaved lives. And so that's, I mean, our project now is to connect over time, to connect the registers, the people in the registers, with all the work that we've done on the slave owners and the estates so that we can map much better. I mean, we won't be able to do it for Lucky Valley in the 1760s, but might be able to, um, will be able to certainly for estates in the early 19th century. But to get, at, to get at the experience is of course incredibly difficult. And that's where quite a number of historians have turned to what's now called critical fabulation, which is it's not fiction writing, but it's somewhere between history and fiction um, as a way of reimagining uh, what enslaved lives were like. And of course, they were so varied. It's so different on the plantations and in urban slavery, for example. There are many levels to this. There's a question at the top. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, this talk really uh, um, uh, managed to attract me to uh, have an interest in the slavery <laughs> anyway. Um, I just wonder, um, so far, uh, the, the, the institution of slavery has been presented in a very negative way because of uh, the manipulation, um, racism, and so on. Do, 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 do you have any idea that is, that is the existence of uh, opinion or, or attitude to suggest that slavery could be practiced in a very ethical way in order to justify ESA execution, uh, uh, apart from the, the racial uh, race, uh, racism and so on. I'm sorry, or can in, somebody... In historical context... Can you just clarify for me what... Well, let's say, um, so far we have heard um, um, the, the, uh, the, argue, uh, the current... Uh, argument that uh, slavery is not good. It's, it's, it's oh, I'm sorry. I think if I understand what you're, uh, what you're talking about, I mean, there have been so many systems of slavery, so many systems of slavery, many of them not racialized, 
In fact, Orlando Patterson argues that in his comparative work on slave systems, it's relatively unusual, the forms of racialization that we find in chattel slavery, which is this particular form in the Caribbean, particularly in the 18th and early 19th century. So, but the, f but the racialization which occurred on the colonial plantations, which were then taken into the uh, system of indentured labor, which followed after slavery, which is not slavery, but which is you know, forced labor, and all the other forms of bonded labor which um, were engaged in across the empire, the patterns of racialization get reworked and reconfigured in these other forms of enforced labor. But they're different from, I think it's really important to distinguish between chattel slavery and other forms of slavery, or indeed between that and modern slavery, which of course operates on a very different set of parameters. Okay, uh, in that case, um, do, do you have any idea about the religious view, uh, as we said, or I, I guess your Christianity on uh, this particular, how to practice uh, slavery in an ethical way during that time, during the, I'm talking about 18th and 19th century. Do, 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 did you have did did you discover any idea of that? Any idea of I'm sorry I'm of how uh, uh, the so-called ethical slavery uh, uh, in the religious uh, perspective um, do, uh, in, do in those you, days. Do you mean how religion justified it? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry, I didn't understand that. I'm, I apologize. Um, yeah, religion was absolutely used to justify it, but interestingly, long although. Every so often, he refers to divine providence. He was clearly not a religious man at all. He's much more um, an 18th century Enlightenment man with a, you know, God is useful when he comes in and um, his divine providence happens to tell you what you want to know. But of course, the, I mean, the Church of England in Jamaica was completely... Um, embedded in the system of slavery and justified it. Sometimes they justify it on the theological grounds in relation to the original story of Ham. There are different theological justifications for it, but that's one, I mean, theology is one of the major forms of justification in the 18th century debates. We'll take a final question. Thank you for such an interesting talk. Um, I was just wondering if, in the work of Edward Long, um, anything kind of comes through about the gendered aspect of both kind of enslavement itself and gendered work and in the kind of bodily and anatomical descriptions that um, you discussed. And on a kind of second slash slightly connected question, where does gender fit in the history of racial capitalism as racial capitalism becomes a more and more kind of studied subject? Well, I'm so glad you asked that because I didn't, you know, I can only talk about some bits and gender got completely marginalized, but of course it's crucial. It's absolutely crucial. And forms of racialization are always gendered. Um, so the fact that it's uh, African men who do the skilled work because women's work is seen as unskilled. Um, but of course, the absolutely central issue is that the fact that slavery is made hereditary and that the wombs of enslaved women do not belong to themselves, that their children are born as the property of their owner, not as their own property, not as their own children. And that is never actually legalized in Jamaica. It is in certain, some of the American colonies, but it's not in Jamaica. But it's completely standard practice. So that idea that, I mean, um, Edward Long's great-grandfather, Samuel, in his will in 1682, he left his wife and his daughter human property, and he left them women and their, what the term that's used is their increase. So the 
the unborn children of these women are part of the future labor force, part of the future capital of the slave owner. That's vital. And in the 18th century, Long is very worried because he realizes when he comes back to England that the slave trade is actually at risk. And of course he lives, I mean, he sees its abolition. And okay, so the level of, levels of mortality on the plantation are so high that slave owners are having to buy new enslaved people every year. So it's a huge capital investment. And, but they do all these horrible sums about you know, how quickly, even though they die young, even so, they're worth their price. But once the slave trade ended, Long saw that the, uh, slave, that the enslaved population must be able to reproduce itself, otherwise there was going to be a real problem. So he has a whole interest in developing new practices of uh, more care for pregnant women, special privileges for pregnant women, organizing the superannuated women to look after the small children, let the, let the parents visit the small children and see how well they're being looked after because that would warm the hearts of the, of the parents. All this stuff. And then the other half of all of that, which I haven't said a single word about, is that the family patterns of the, of the planters and the slave owners and their patterns of marriage and inheritance are absolutely gendered and completely crucial to the construction of family dynasties. So their protection of the property and their, the transmission of women um, and women's property through marriage is all very, very important to the system as a whole that's developing. So yeah, it's vital. <laughs> Thank you. On that note, uh, thank you so much for a wonderful talk and thank you to the public for coming as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. That, that was Oof. fantastic and a wonderful way to end this, this trio of, of uh, talks for the Legacy of Slavery Working Party and for, for Veronique to finish her work. That's not all, all we have this year. So uh, next week, if you'd like to come back, we have Ros Atkins from the BBC talking about the art of explanation. The week after that, we have Olympic cyclist Chris Boardman coming to speak and there's more to come. So uh, I hope to see you again and again. Thank you very much.